everyone for coming. We'll start with uh, a roll call of the legislative subcommittee. Uh, I suppose. Uh, want me to take it for you? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, mayor? Here. Assistant Mayor? Here. Representative Tabor? Yeah, here. And I'm sorry, Councillor Cook? Here. And then uh, City Manager? I am here as a non-voting member. Happy and, to be here. Uh, Assistant City Attorney Jane Farini here also, non-voting member. And also, uh, if the representatives could identify themselves, Becky? Representative Becky McBeth, do we push this or just leave it? It's on. Just leave it. It's always on. It's always, on. Yeah. It's always on. So <laughs> it's off if Thank you push the button. Yep. And Representative and David Representative Muse. David Muse. And then uh, via our webinar, uh, we have two other representatives with us. If you could identify yourself and get off mute first as a little helpful hint first thing on a Monday. <laughs> He's pointing. Go ahead, Jerry. <laughs> well, I was going to do ladies first. Well, anyway, Jerry Ward, state rep. Hi, Joan Hamlet, state rep. And could you all please be sure to speak into the microphone so we can hear you clearly? Thank you. Have you been able to hear us so far? I can hear some of you, but some of you are muffled. Okay, thanks. How is this, Joan? Can you hear me? The, I can hear you, David. Great. Okay. Awesome. Represent, Representative Somsich had a dentist appointment, so he gives his regrets. So that was a popular Monday after vacation. Uh, I know that uh, Karen is going to be leaving us a little early for a dentist appointment as well. Um, so uh, glad to see everybody's taking their dental health uh, very seriously. Um, so uh, again, thank you all for coming. I know the, the work that you guys are doing is um, uh, tireless and, and often uh, thankless, uh, but we in the city of Portsmouth appreciate uh, the work that, that you guys are, are doing on, on behalf um, of, our, of our city uh, and of our residents. And we understand that this um, has been probably a tougher uh, session than, than anyone can really recount um, in, uh, in memory. There's been times when uh, you know, it's been uh, more divided in terms of numbers, but it's tough to remember a time when there's, you know, so many factions that are going on and, mm -hmm. and government itself uh, is, uh, is, at, is at stake. Um, and so it's appreciated the work that you're doing, you know, um, and that you've taken the time to meet with us uh, means a lot to the city of Portsmouth and uh, to this committee uh, personally. So, um, with that, we'll, we'll, we'll I look for a motion to approve the uh, the minutes from January thirty first. So moved, Your Honor. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And we do not need a roll call vote uh, because non-voting members are on the Zoom. Just for the you know, the, no, that was an issue before. So, um, we would love to hear um, an update on. Uh, from the legislative delegation. Um, so we first have uh, Senator uh, Perkins Quoka, but we will uh, pause. Um, I don't know if she wanted to speak on redistricting or if that was a separate uh, uh, line item that somebody else wanted to speak on, but I know that um, there were some bills identified from uh, Representative Muse. So we'll start with those and uh, hopefully we can uh, hear from the Senator when she gets here. So so one of the, one of the, the fairly consistent themes in this legislative session um, have been uh, bills introduced to pare back uh, the things that uh, municipalities are allowed to do under New Hampshire law. Um, I think another thing that we've seen is we've seen uh, a pretty active uh, effort. Uh, I think some, including me, would, would call it to, to micromanage uh, our public schools. Um, so along those lines, um, HB 1266 uh, is a bill uh, that would prohibit uh, municipalities like Portsmouth from adopting or enforcing policies uh, that restrict the enforcement of federal immigration laws uh, to somebody who's already in custody. So one of the things to understand is that a federal immigration detainer is a civil detainer, not a criminal detainer. So um, we're not actually talking about uh, a violation uh, of the law. Uh, 
um, uh, and an ICE civil detainer doesn't actually have uh, the force of law uh, un under our laws. So this is one uh, I think that concerning a number of people, it would um, uh, essentially uh, prohibit any New Hampshire city from being a New Ham a, a sanctuary city. It would repeal the um, the ordinances uh, effectively of the cities that have done that. Um, and that received an 11 to 10 ought to pass recommendation uh, from the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee on which I sit and uh, um, I voted against that recommendation, but it will come to the House floor probably sometime later this month. Uh, HB 1072 prohibits and criminalizes uh, the den denial of access to school facilities, documents, or school events uh, to people who are in elected school district positions. So one of the things I think that we've seen in, in Portsmouth over the years, and I think most communities sort of share this with us, is that if an elected school official, uh, uh, a, uh, a school board member, uh, wants information from the administration, they ask for it, and they get it. Um, exceptions include things like uh, EIPs and things like that that are uh, that are that are um, confidential and personal to the student uh, and and things like that. What this bill would essentially do um, is. Uh, open up access to a, a fairly large class of documents. There was an amendment uh, that did restrict um, access to documents that actually aren't already protected under New Hampshire law. So that that is, you know, one good thing uh, in favor of moderation. But essentially uh, what it means is that if, if you have a person uh, who's elected to a school committee and for one reason or another they want to be uh, disruptive, um, School officials will not be able to, die, uh, to deny them access to facilities, you know, regardless of the way they behave. Um, and uh, it's, it, it's one of these things I think we're kind of seeing. It's, it's been, a, been a contentious year in a lot of different, uh, different respects. Um, but this is an attempt to uh, basically use the power of law and use the power of the legislature um, to achieve something that can typically be achieved by civil people having a civil conversation. Um, so uh, it was a bill that I voted against in committee, but it was another bill that passed 11 to 10 and will go to the full house. Um, HB 1033 is one I know that uh, uh, concerns almost everybody in municipal government in New Hampshire because essentially what it would do is it would um, eliminate uh, uh, our ability to give the New Hampshire Municipal Association money to do lobbying. So one of the reasons why um, we're not up there testifying on every single bill that affects municipalities is because the Municipal Association over the years has done a really good job um, representing its members, letting people know what's going on. Their, their website, if you're unfamiliar with it, is just a great resource for all the, all the, the bills that are in front of the legislature that affect munis municipalities. Um, and this, this basically is something that, um, uh, again, um, there are, uh, there has been uh, a sort of a theme in this session of the legislature to remove um, the ability of municipalities uh, to do things that they are currently allowed to do under New Hampshire law. And um, this bill uh, essentially is a way to take a critical voice in support of municipalities out of the picture. Um, uh, and again, uh, this bill has actually already um, made it through the full House. Um, it is now going to go to the to the House Finance Committee, um, and it'll come back with. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, this 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 actually. Uh, I, I'm actually. I think I messed up here. Um, uh, let me check. Yeah. That's the finance um, for yeah, this, 14, this, this, this is this is one where we had a bunch of people where, where essentially we had initially a vote uh, against the bill. The vote was overturned, um, and now it now it's come back. Um, another HB 307 would declare um, municipal ordinances and regulations null and void um, that uh, regulate firearms in any way. So, for example, um, the property in back of uh, in, in, in Jones Avenue and back of the high school where the high school cross country team runs and that's currently posted 
um, no firearms. We wouldn't be able to do that as a community. We would have to take those uh, sound, those signs down, and if we chose to leave them up, um, uh, any citizen, I believe, it, it's kind of gone back and forth, um, but I believe it's any any citizen in the community can basically come forward, and um, and claim a civ what amounts to a civil bounty uh, until uh, and that the city would have to pay. Uh, if uh, the law wasn't immediately removed from the books. So this particular one has actually passed the House and the Senate. Um, the Senate amended it, so it's going to come back to the House either as a motion to concur with the changes the Senate made, uh, or it's going to come back um, as a, um, uh, as, as a, uh, uh, it, it, one of the things that could happen is there, there could be a conference committee, but um, it seems fairly unlikely uh, that this is, uh, that they're, the Senate and the House are not going to reach some sort of an agreement on this, and uh, it's likely the governor will sign it. Um, another bill I just wanted to get on your radar, too, is one that actually was a really nice win, uh, and that's a bill that um, would restore 7.5% um, of the original 35% of payments for municipalities in the state retirement system. That was uh, uh, stripped away about a decade ago under the the uh, 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 O'Brien House, um, and uh, uh, since then, I know a lot of municipalities, including Portsmouth, have been trying to get some of that money back. Seven and a half percent isn't even, uh, you know, is a, is a fairly small fraction of the of the money that came into the city before. But seven and a half percent is better than the zero percent um, that's coming in now, and it would make a big difference for the city. That bill has actually passed in the House, um, and that's the one that's in the Finance Committee. That's where I made them, I confused it with the earlier bill. This one now goes to the to the House Finance Committee, which essentially is charged with figuring out a way to either pay for it, uh, or the other thing that they can do is just simply recommend to kill it. Whatever recommendation they make will come back to the House for another vote. Um, if it passes the House again, then it will move over to the Senate. Um, and. Uh, uh, Senator Perkins Cuoco will be, um, you know, uh, probably huge on point <laughs> to try to get it passed over there. But those are uh, those are four that I just wanted to highlight. Um, the Municipal Association has a really comprehensive list of other bills that have come before the um, the legislature that um, uh, that will affect municipalities. We are talking here, literally, about the tip of the iceberg. I don't think I've ever. I mean. This is my second term, but I know in the previous term, um, we had a few bills that affected municipalities, um, and, and probably the biggest ones regarded education and education funding. Um, but um, we just didn't see this level of enthusiastic effort to trying to strip away the power of municipalities to do what, you know, what municipalities do in New Hampshire. So, um, if there are any questions, I'll I can try to answer them or. We Thanks, can move on. Okay. Representative Muse, I think we do have some. I have some questions, but first I'll open it up to if there's uh, Councilor Tabor. So if the, the bill banning uh, lobbying were to pass, would that eliminate our ability to do coalition communities against? Um, it, would, it wouldn't ban lobbying. It would ban your ability to pay the lobbyist. So. Right. So, but what the outfall of that is that um, it would just be harder for the municipal association to represent municipalities as broadly or as thoroughly or as well uh, as it does now. And so, if this passes, the work of this committee becomes much more important because there will be bills that the the municipal association probably won't have the staff or resources uh, to testify on to work on because they'll be cash strapped um, so it'll be important for folks like us to know about that so if there are things that are important to Portsmouth we can step into the breach and um, and make sure that we're up there yeah I was more okay. thinking not just NHMA which is very valuable but uh, if uh, we once again had to take issue with a donor town tax structure as we did some time back it sounds like mm -hmm. 
we'd lose our power to do that. It would, it would, your, your ability to pay somebody else to do it for you would be affected. Right. Um, your ability to do it yourself would not be affected. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Councilor Cook. Uh, I also have a question on this particular bill. How would uh, this prohibition on spending tax dollars for lobbying, would it limit our ability to have Jane continue her work or our ability to have city councilors even speak because we technically are paid. Are you, you're, are you, you're asking if city councilors would be affected in their ability to testify because they're paid? Because we're paid. You're not lobbyists, you're elected representatives. So I, I, I don't, I would need to look at the bill a little more closely, but my guess is that would never have flown <laughs> in committee. Um, as divided as we can be these days, uh, that, I think that would be going too far. Yeah, I think there is a statute that describes the ability of elected officials to to testify on behalf of cities and and uh, other folks. Um, so I I think that analysis is is correct that that you have the ability as a representative of the city to go and testify, but it's an interesting question about staff, right? To, because if we say, I believe, and I'm going out on a limb here because I haven't reviewed that statute in a while, but if, if we are going on behalf of the mayor or going on behalf of this committee, I think that distinction would clearly have to be made because I think that statutory scheme references that as well. But I'd have to reread that and, and double check, but it's definitely a chilling effect for sure. Um, there are no other questions from the, the council. I had a couple of questions. The anti-sanctuary cities bill, um, that's a, there's immigration uh, cities that are designated like, as immigration cities in the, in the state of New Hampshire. This is separate from that. Um, this is not a requirement of the, um, there's no, I guess to your point on this being a civil action that ICE would take as civil detainment, there's no requirement um, and has been proven on the federal level of, of us providing any information to ICE or any other detainment. So I guess what's the practical effect of, of, of this? The, pra the practical effect would be um, that something that we are currently, you know, prohibiting our police department from doing, they would, they would actually be able to do it. They would actually be able to cooperate if they wanted to you know for example if, okay. if if we were holding somebody on another charge and an ice detainer flag came up um, uh, we could call ice um, and uh, and that and have that person and that person would then be on ice's radar and and charged with immigration violations okay I think that would I mean that's uh, we have now principles I don't know if we shared but they're similar to what and we've approved those, those might fall under, you know, might be against that, support the civil rights of individuals and oppose discrimination against any individual because of age, sex, race, creed, color, marital status, family status, physical or mental disability, national origin, it might be trapped under national origin is something that we could be opposed to this bill based on the principles that we already state. So I'd like us to, uh, if we want to oppose that bill, to choose that, uh, you know, legislative principle 15 to, uh, to do so. Um, do we want to vote on, on these in, uh, so, uh, a way to motion to, uh, I'd move that we, uh, write a letter in opposition to, David, this is 1266 HB 1266. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. And then HB uh, 1072, criminal penalties for denying elected school officials access to school facilities documents. And that's, I guess, to the heart of that is trying to figure out what the, um, around the mask, et cetera, uh, policies. Uh, this probably grew out of that. Um, I don't know. Um, you know, I would imagine that we would be opposed to this based on, you know, advocate to maintain local authority. Um, and so I would wait a motion to oppose uh, HB 1272. 1072. 
So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, HB 1033, um, I would, uh, under the same grounds, advocate to maintain local authority. I would wait a motion to uh, oppose this bill. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, H, uh, HB 10 uh, or uh, 1417, um, I would, uh, I don't know how we're going to, I, I would say in support, um, uh, maybe under, um, uh, three revenue streams to aid municipalities. Um, uh, I'd wait a motion to support HB 1417. So, so moved. Go ahead. Either way. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then on uh, Senate Bill 307, nullification of ordinances that prohibit possession of guns and knives on the municipal property. Um, a couple of questions on this. Uh, one, we don't have the ability, as I understand, to prohibit uh, or, or whatever flows down from the state level. And this already flows down from the state level that we can't make uh, rules. So You don't have the ability to create new regulations, um, but uh, essentially what the, other, the old bill did was it grandfathered current regulations. Um, oh. So what this would do is it would essentially wipe those current regulations off the books unless they were things, you know, for instance, you can still do things like, um, you know, zoning law, for example, would still apply if somebody wanted to open a gun shop in Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but, it, but essentially the laws that, that the ordinances we have that basically ban firearms from public parks um, would basically become null and void. Mm -hmm. As well as schools, right? Because uh, as I understand, the f there's a federal firearms uh, act that prevents uh, people from carrying guns into schools unless they are licensed to do so. Um, and since we have uh, uh, a, a concealed carry by right in the state of New Hampshire, anyone then would be allowed to carry a gun into schools unless otherwise regulated previously. Um, is that, would that go away? Would we? We, we have, as a state, uh, several, this has come up several times, um, the ability for uh, New Hampshire to support school safety zones. So one of the things um, that we can do right now is if you, be, because firearms actually are prohibited from schools under federal law, you can call a federal agent. Um, but what you can't do is call your local police department unless there is another incident or the impending threat of another incident. Um, uh, so it essentially, it's uh, if somebody, you know, open, you know, brings their child into school and open carries a firearm into school, um, there's literally nothing local police officers uh, can do. This this is an issue that also has come up now that um, uh, now that uh, basically firearms are allowed into polling places and. Um, uh, a lot of times during elections, um, school is in session. Uh, so we have a situation where, and I don't think we've, we've faced this yet in Portsmouth, but uh, Manchester and other cities have faced it, where there are actually you know, people on, on the school property near the electioneering zone, and in some cases actually inside the polls, um, while there are kids in the school uh, who are actually carrying firearms. I, I, uh, I filed a bill um, that uh, would uh, prohibit open carry of firearms in, uh, in polling places um, that was actually defeated in the House, uh, has an ITL recommendation. Okay. So and we, so, we tried. <laughs> and then, and this also adds the, the, uh, the we don't have any laws in the books, or, or we don't currently allow uh, knives into school. This would strip our ability to uh, to prevent knives from going into schools as, as well. Is that also correct? Yeah, student, students are prohibited, um, but anybody else is not. Okay, so um, I, and then there's a curious portion of that uh, that would allow the governor to remove uh, people non-complying uh, with that. Uh, and as the 
person who sets the agenda, uh, I guess that would be myself. Um, so if I did not bring forth an agenda, uh, the governor uh, could remove me from office um, based on, on this bill. So um, I will uh, await a motion to write a letter in opposition to uh, Senate Bill uh, 307 uh, and send that um, upon uh, signature uh, to, the, uh, to the governor. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, I had one question on the bill. Uh, David, when I was reading it the first, first time around, it's a lot to digest, but the first line or paragraph says that current bills will be null and void. But then it goes on to, there's two other sections of the bill. One says any citizen in the, in the town can bring an action um, if there's a bill on the books and you have 60 days to remove it. My understanding was that was if there were new ordinances and that this bill would act as, uh, you know, to supersede any other, any of the ordinance that currently exists. But I find the sections of the bill confusing because then there's yet a third section, and this is what the mayor was referring to, that if a person, I think, who has been aggrieved, then the, then the penalties become very, very, very large, and also the removal from office in, in the event that it's a, a willful violation. So has your committee clarified, discussed, questioned some of the language of this bill? The language of this bill has actu actually changed in the Senate. Um, it was amended. Um, that's one of the reasons why the motion to concur is necessary before it goes to the governor. Um, uh, what I what I need to do is is to sit down and see what the differences are between the Senate bill and between what we sent over in the House. It also changed several times in the House. Mm -hmm. It was amended in the House, I think, at least twice. Um, so there's been a fair amount of back and forth over th over this particular one. But when I did when I looked at the Senate when I, when I looked at the Senate amendment a couple of weeks ago, I looked at it quickly. Um, I didn't see anything that really substantially changed or would impact the way that I think Portsmouth would feel about this bill one way or the other. Um, so I, I can go back and look at it again. Uh, but what I, what I would suggest is um, take a look at the amendment in the docket. The last Senate amendment in the docket okay. is the bill that's coming over to the House now. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah, one out of one out of four, David. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, thank you, uh, Senator Perkins Koka. Um, would love to hear uh, any updates that that you have for the committee. No pressure if you don't. But yeah, no. Thanks for having. Thanks me, for guys. being here. Yeah, and apologies for being a few minutes late. I was just wrapping up something for work. Um, nice to be with you guys. As we approach crossover, we're not there yet, um, but you know, there's a few bills we were working on together um, here at the city, so I wanted to provide an update on those. Uh, they were SB 437 and 441, um, which uh, asked for us to have the ability to charge not just a $5 fee at car registration, but potentially up to $15 as an additional source of local revenue. Uh, though we had bipartisan support on that, um, it did not make it out of committee, unfortunately. Um, and that was the one I think we had a better chance on. So I think it was good to bring it back. It has been a bill that's seen some success in the past. And, um, you know, I think with some discussion and, um, you know, that face is probably a good chance going forward, um, but unfortunately not this year. Um, 437, which was the ability of municipalities to have a share of um, speeding ticket revenue. So uh, currently, which I know Mayor and I both discussed is surprising, um, local speeding tickets, when they are um, collected, 100% of that revenue actually goes to the state. And so um, none of it supports our local police force or you know the cost of providing them. There are policy questions on both sides of this debate. And one of the points raised on the other side is that um, you would never want a municipal officer to have an incentive to stop someone or to provide a speeding ticket. And so that's been sort of a longstanding reason that that the policy is that way. Um, you know, I think we all know that um, 
municipalities are always looking for ways to raise revenue and to keep property taxes down. And so it, it was a debate that was had in committee, um, and ultimately that bill did not make it out of committee either at this stage. Um, so it's something we can consider you know, bringing back in the future if we want to. Uh, another one that I know is is important to the city, which um, Senator Sue Prentice uh, from up in Grafton County filed this year, is the one on uh, what we call the pillow tax, but I guess uh, it's sort of a local term for that because um, people didn't recognize that name up in the state house. But I think it's it's growing. Um, the you know it's the ability for us to charge an additional dollar or two per room per night of occupancy in our hotels and. Um, the bill itself faced opposition. What we were able to do is to get a study committee set up, which that's actually the farthest this concept has ever made it. Um, so the bill that incorporated um, the commission that would explore this enabling legislation did make it out of the Senate uh, unanimously. So that's SB 343, I don't know when that comes over to you. Um, it was 338 before, but now the amendment's on 343. Um, and then uh, I know just I think in fun long-term news, you know, talking about offshore wind, there have been a couple of bills uh, that came through energy and um, one was was sort of intended to be, you know, a procurement effort for offshore wind. It, it got scaled back, but it did create the Office of Offshore Wind in our new Department of Energy which is a good thing. I think it'll be important to have staff time, you know, at the state level sort of focused on this effort. And um, while every effort towards offshore wind is probably years away, it's, it's, I think, very important for New Hampshire to be constantly understanding, you know, where is our space um, to kind of participate in offshore wind and how can we bring those benefits back to this district? You know, I think some of the benefits that have been discussed are certainly um, construction staging, you know, so along the banks of the Scatacoa River, being able to lay down equipment um, that potentially comes from overseas. Uh, and then another opportunity is for inventory at Pease, you know, to sort of store parts or store pieces that are needed in construction. Certainly a huge one is jobs, you know, being able to um, staff the construction of offshore wind in, in the Gulf of Maine is is a cool opportunity and I know the community college is watching that closely. So again these are all years away. Um, as a reminder on offshore wind, you know, New Hampshire's state coastline always extends uh, for every state three miles offshore. In New Hampshire's case we actually have the Isles of Shoals and so um, our coastline is a full three miles past that so it's 13 miles offshore. Um, and after that, it's federal water. And so that, that would get leased um, through the federal agency, through the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management, BOEM. Um, and, you know, that goes out as far as you can kind of contemplate. I think colloquially, you know, being able to build wind outside of the view of local communities is something that's talked about commonly in the wind industry um, for offshore because you can still get the energy while, you know, sort of accommodating, um, you know, any concerns about viewshed. And then obviously there's lots of wildlife concerns, you know, engineering concerns and others that sort of come with all this. Where to bring the power on shore locally is one that continues to be heavily discussed. Um, I got to take a tour of Schiller Station, you know, where we sort of talked about what they're their future plans could be and um, and the new owners there are very cooperative and sort of understanding what the future needs might be and I think none of none of any of this has materialized into anything concrete there's no agreements there's no um, you know nothing binding in place but I think there's a lot of possibility for us and so having someone at the state level that's paying attention to all that and especially keeping um, Portsmouth updated I think will be really important so that, that was sort of a fun piece of work. Um, and then SB 249, obviously, is something we're working on together as short-term rentals. And um, I spent a bunch of time um, after that bill made it out of committee. We had, what, four or five days um, between when it passed as amended out of committee and when it, it came to the Senate floor, um, you know, sort of talking to other senators to see if there was support to amend it. And 
And basically what the bill does is, um, at a fundamental level, is it says that um, short-term rentals can't be prohibited. And it defines short-term rentals in an odd way as um, single-family or two-family structures. So um, it allows the town to continue enforcing its other ordinances, you know, on noise, on parking, on setbacks, and other zoning. Um, but, you know, does essentially require that there be some way for a short-term rental to be allowed, for example, in a single-family neighborhood. And so um, there was not a lot of support to amend the bill, um, perhaps surprisingly, but I, I think it's because, you know, we're a tourist community, we're on the front lines of this battle. Um, you know, we understand it in a way that North Conway can understand it. Um, but I think few communities have sort of internalized how this could affect their long-term housing stock, their housing costs yet. Um, so I did um, send an email, I think, to some of you. I don't know if I included the whole delegation yet, but um, I think that as it comes over to the House, we should work together once it's assigned to committee to figure out who can bring an amendment for us. And, and I think the content of that amendment is important. And I, I sent a couple questions to you guys, if you have a couple minutes, that I think would just be um, useful to discuss. And then I can kind of take those concepts forward. So. Um, one of them was owner occupancy, and I know the mayor and I spoke um, extensively about that. And he, you know, he's been very in touch with me to make sure that we're protecting Portsmouth on this issue. Um, and so, in my discussion with other senators, one thing that came up um, in other places is, you know, a lot of districts have um, houses that are owner occupied, but it might be someone that's away, you know, and so they might spend the winter in Florida, but rent their house out for skiing. Um, and, you know, traditionally, owner occupancy, I think, as we would um, think of it in its broadest use, would be that there's an owner on site, you know, whether that's in the same home or, you know, like in the main house and, and the short term rental is a guest house. And so, um, you know, I think that contemplating how we might be willing to expand that a little might gain us a little support, just listening to. Um, you know, the feedback that other legislators are getting, I think that there's a lot of people who do use their homes in that way to sort of be away from their home um, and rent it when they're not occupying it. And so I think um, we could gain votes by contemplating whether that's something that's acceptable to Portsmouth um, to include that as, as um, sort of our definition of owner occupancy, you know? And then um, a second question I have is, is sort of what what do we want to be able to do in these single family zones? I mean, um, the position of the Association of Realtors who are bringing this bill is that um, short term rentals are a residential use, and I think I would maintain, and I think Jane would probably maintain, and maybe others, that I mean, this is at minimum a quasi commercial use, um, and potentially, you know, could be considered a fully commercial use. So. You know, I think it's it's always been at least my view, and and I would welcome everyone else's that zoning is an appropriate mechanism to regulate short-term rentals, and that you know because they have commercial aspects to them, that um, we want to be able to place them in our our various zones um, in a way that's accommodating to our residents and to our neighborhoods. And so, one way to do that would be through a permit system, and. Um, you know, that's how we issue the right to, you know, um, have other uses in our city is through permits, conditional use permits or um, special use permits. And so that could be something we explore. I don't think the realtors, um, I think we'd have to do it carefully because they would likely oppose a permit system because their intent is for um, this use to be able to um, exist. And I think they fear that permit system might hamper the use. Um, and I agree that it might, but that it's also important for the residents to have their say. So welcome discussion. Uh, uh, so the just on the, and thank you, uh, Senator Perkins Kulka, the, um, the realtors are supportive of this because, as I would understand and, and, and would love to hear if this is different, that it 
uh, and it creates a, a larger market uh, for them to sell houses uh, because it raises the value of a home that is currently in long-term rental. It creates a value to convert that to short-term rental and increase the price of a sale. That's something that Valerie, uh, or sorry, not Valerie, um, Roseanne Lentz uh, believes uh, in, in the city of Portsmouth, um, but has the consequence of taking long-term rentals off of the market and putting them into short-term rentals, which very much directly opposes uh, any efforts that we're making from an affordability standpoint uh, in the state, which I now believe has somewhat broad bipartisan support mm -hmm. from a recognition that it's an important issue, at least from the governor, has identified it in his state of the state as a major issue that, you know, the only thing that he positioned as Massachusetts beating us on was affordable housing or creation of, of housing. Everything else, we are far and away superior in every, in every, uh, in every way. In every way. So uh, I was interested and somewhat disappointed to hear that the housing authority has not taken any official position on that. Do you think that they will before the House votes on this? Uh, New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority? Yeah. yeah, I could ask them. They often don't um, take positions on legislation, actually, so they tend to view themselves as a technical resource. Um, could they, um, if we worked with them, uh, could they at least dispel the myth that the realtors have, that they are separate markets, that this would have an impact on long-term rentals? Yeah, I think I think it's a great idea. Um, maybe we could reach out to Housing Action New Hampshire, um, who does do advocacy to sort of talk about um, how this impacts availability. Because um, one of the points I made to my fellow senators uh, was that you know even if you're not in a tourist community, this this problem of long-term housing stock exists everywhere and affects all of us and. And the fact that you can value a home now based on its, you know, overnight short-term rental value does impact housing prices um, for all of us in every market. You know, the vacancy rate is one percent across the state. It's not just in southern New Hampshire. Um, so I think that, you know, bringing that idea to them could help dispel some of the misinformation. But I also think that exploring you know, what we want the content oh. of our amendment to be is important because I think that's that's sort of our option at this point. And another thing we could do, you know, just to address this, um, you know, in terms of like how we would proceed is, is we could explore if it is a permit-based system, putting a, a cap on the permits locally. So for example, you'd have a number of short-term rentals that you would know as a city um, could exist in your municipality, and that would give you a tool to balance, you know, long-term housing stock with short-term housing stock. For example, if Portsmouth has 10,000 housing units, we would know what percentage or number of those, you know, were being used as short-term rentals, so that we can continue to meet our very important goal of long-term housing stock. You know, as the mayor has brought up. So uh, on that, in terms of uh, trying to think on the fly on, on what could encompass both the, uh, you know, I, I understand that there's a desire of, you know, New Hampshire says that, you know, not, not yourself, but your house has to pay property taxes. You know, that's how we fund the whole system. So for your house to actually earn money is an attractive thing that I understand uh, and am certainly cognizant of. But if we could limit it to, um, uh, houses where you reside. An owner is allowed to, um, if they, in, frankly, I, I guess I care less about a, a uh, somebody that lives in New Hampshire but does not reside in New Hampshire looking to rent out their home um, in New Hampshire. Then, and that, it could definitely be still allowed on the, the, the individual towns. This would not prevent that. But from a blanket statement of saying that this is something that could have a residency requirement, uh, of a house um, for a, somebody to be permitted to have that. They have, it has to be their place of residence. Okay, that's an interesting idea, I like that. Is there, oh. um, I know there's been concern from, from North Conway and Laconia that corporations are coming in. Yeah. So I wonder, would the wording of that or even more stringent wording, um, or how we would word it, to limit corporations from purchasing homes to then 
turn them into short-term rentals? Would, do, do we feel like the residency requirement, um, would that block it, even if, say, the, the person who owned the corporation was a resident? Yeah, I, I think it's a good idea. Um, I would want to explore what, um, what some of our allies, you know, in this fight might think, because I would, I would say it, yes, you know, we want to include that in the definition of owner occupancy that, you know, it has to be an individual, a human. Um, but I also think it, what you bring up goes to enforcement too, yeah. because we want to make sure that, um, it, you know, if there is a violation of your permit or the ordinance that there's somebody to go to, you know, the case in Conway, which you're referring to, mm -hmm. I think, um, there's a nuisance use that's been just going on for about 10 years. And so, um, there's no way to enforce against it. them, you know, and I think that that's part of our goal. So I think that's a really good point. Got the table. Um, yeah, I, I think if you believe we could get some cap on the number, I think that would be great. Um, looking at Conway, they've got 600 units, 600 houses. That's about 10% of their housing stock. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if that means that we would be looking at a thousand houses or ten thousand houses ten percent um and that's a significant impact on a community significant right. impact on neighborhoods um so uh, and and in conway as as we've talked about what we're seeing is entrepreneurs go into the lodging business by buying four five six eight ten houses and doing short-term rentals so that i think that's if you play the movie forward on this bill that's where it ends up so a cap i wonder if we could define um short term as a week and anything less than the week we could regulate Interesting. Um, maybe, maybe there's support for that yeah because mm -hmm. that actually was a question i meant to send to you jane many ordinances address transient use sort of in other ways and I, mm -hmm. I haven't um, reached out to you to ask how ours does <laughs> or whether it defines that um, not in terms of days but in terms of the 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 types of places that are used for transient use so um, our transient use ordinance um, and our short-term rental case all def revolved around the term dwelling unit and what is a dwelling unit and what isn't a dwelling unit and what isn't a dwelling unit is a transient occupancy quote unquote and our ordinance defined transient occupancy as um, and gave examples like boarding house hotel motel and it wasn't a complete list of transient uses mm -hmm. but because it wasn't a complete list of transient uses we couldn't regulate short-term rental as a transient use so it it's it's very specific from town to the next town mm -hmm. even though Conway had sort of similar arguments similar issues similar definitional debates shall we say their ordinance was drafted differently and it was really because our transient occupancy was defined in terms of samples okay. and that's the that's why we won at the supreme court for for that whether we can you know obviously there's been a lot to look at to a lot of talk about workforce housing mm -hmm. a lot of talk about zoning amendments so um certainly that's something that um isn't the easiest thing to for the layperson to understand obviously mm -hmm. so further definitions and and further exploration of those um is is probably forthcoming at a point yeah okay. Okay. And, and i just would concur with the mayor that uh, if the owner's on site um these are much better managed in terms of uh, community impact than mm -hmm. if the owners mm -hmm. away and I, I think I emailed you the case of uh, our neighborhood where somebody would vacate take his family and stay in a motel and rent it out 
<laughs> and, um, and it was being rented out for weekends only. Um, and, you know, that's, that's what <laughs> one of the neighbors called the cops for a beer party and mm -hmm. so. Okay. They wouldn't have called if they were serving wine, it's just the beer. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> there, there was a, I remember a case a couple of years ago, there, there was a woman in my, my district who bought the house next door yep. and ran into issues. So would, would there be flexibility in, in an ordinance to not only include um, someone who uh you know a, a homeowner who's living on the property but mm -hmm. somebody who resides in an adjacent property right. so um because this it'll come up it'll I, come up yeah I, I guess uh this is not a legislative uh, agreement uh although it might be my fundamental issue with this bill is um uh, is not for enterprising um, individuals that are looking to make money uh, through tourism in the state of New Hampshire. It's that in the way that they're doing that, and uh, why I'm not super supportive of a cap, is that it says here are the amount of uh, units that we will allow you uh, to take off the long-term rental market in order to pursue this, uh, this goal. Um, it is a fundamental issue that we cannot both uh, any effort that we've made, the 64 units at, at Court Street, those are all going to be in the wash if we allow more units to be converted to short-term rental units. And it's, it, it, I, I want there to be some cost to pay politically for Concord to support this bill and, and, and state that we are doing so while, you know, on the other side of the mouth talking about affordable housing units. Um, and I'll speak to it now, could be dissuaded from it, but that's the reason why we'd have a press conference around this, because I don't think this has been identified as the issue that's at play. There's certainly issues to deal with in terms of noise and pollution, uh, you know, quality of life for neighbors. I, I totally get that. I think that Portsmouth, we need to act on short-term rentals to allow a framework for this to happen. It does allow people to stay in their homes. It does allow people to, um, I, you know, the working stiff case that you mentioned that's the name of the llc mm -hmm. uh, you know i'm not convinced that that's the best and highest use of somebody buying a house wanting their daughter to move in at some point in the future and renting it out you know in the meantime uh because that does take an entire house off the market for a community member to be to live in um, and turns it into a, an, an enterprise which is is great but limited value for you know people that are trying to you know promote the the working of a city but um, Councillor Cook, I have. A, have we worked with the hospitality industry, specifically hotels, on this at all? Because I would think that they would want to lobby against yeah. allowing for <laughs> short-term <laughs> rentals. <laughs> Good question. I know years ago when this conversation uh, and these types of bills were were being discussed there were short-term rentables there was also the hotel occupancy bills that were kind of swimming around the same committees and uh, we had some discussions through the chamber to reach out to our local hotel um, establishment i know that the bread and the b and b folks mm -hmm. are very vociferously objecting and opposing this i have not heard specifically the subset of hotel motels, but definitely B&Bs have been testifying at hearings and writing letters and opposing because they're regulated. And so what they're saying is it's not an even playing field that I have to do X, Y, and Z, and then a residential homeowner would not have to under these types of bills. But I do think our land use committee should also have, um, you know, to speak and finally act upon. Like we have a shadow Airbnb, you know, situation in Portsmouth mm -hmm. where people do yeah. it as long as their neighbors don't snitch on them for doing it that is not how we should run a city or a government so we we should hopefully Joanna can I will bring carry that, that over to the land use <laughs> is, is there also a way to address this by saying that if we allow these then they have to be regulated and taxed in the same way all hotels oh, are, yeah. are they the are they gonna that was the other question are they yeah. gonna be there a non-commercial property or non-commercial use that would be paying room and meals tax I don't know how that happens. And also subject they do to currently. inspection. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they currently play meals in rooms. 
um, or supposed to pay meals and rooms. We know the state's ability to enforce and register. There's a registration and, and all of that. But I think there is a shadow economy, too, that I'm not sure all of that is is getting to the state. Um, and um, that is the, the that's the question I've always had. How can you how can you impose a meals and rooms tax on something that this bill is claiming is a residential use? So I just I don't understand how the state can would you say tooth the size of the mouth. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's an interesting creative way I think to to classify property. So. Um, and my, I have one final question. How does this, it's for single family and uh, duplex single situations. Single family and two family, yeah. How does this impact housing in multi-family zones? Is it just any house that's a single family in a multi-family zone still is impacted or, because we have a lot of ha residential housing that's single family in multi-family zoning neighborhoods sure. in Portsmouth. So I don't. Okay. My is interpretation is every one of those houses could be a short-term rental. Okay, that's just Even that's it, my so, view. Uh, <laughs> the competing uh, bill of every house being able to be a uh, mm -hmm. uh, a four-unit house uh, would that make this a moot point if all single family, <laughs> family yes, houses it's are, true. are viewed as yeah. four-unit houses? It, it might. <laughs> um, okay. Well. Uh, I, I want to be cognizant of time uh, yeah. here, so we've talked about this. A, a lot there's a lot that is going to go into the amendment obviously uh jane is a resource uh to to help uh you know help portsmouth's position yep. uh on this but would love to be able to see something um that could come back to the legislative uh, subcommittee I understand timing doesn't always work that way um but uh before that made it to the house i did want to uh briefly uh point out that um, if possible, uh, I'd like to speak on this bill specifically to try to address some of the affordable issues um, at a press conference. Um, I've been told that um, with your help, I can get one uh, more easily at the legislative uh, office building. So we'll be reaching out uh, around that. And then um, uh, discussion of uh, HB 1255. Um, uh, uh, the assistant mayor has requested we consider writing. Um, I fully support that. I think that there's a number of arenas that this could be supported under. One, advocate to maintain local authority. Uh, two, um, you know, support the civil rights of individuals and oppose discrimination against any individual. Um, and then three, um, let's see, the, oh, use expertise in research and decision making. So I think, you know, understanding that teachers are experts in the field of educating and to trust their judgment uh, in terms uh, of that. I would love to, uh, um, I'd love to, to have a motion uh, to draft a bill uh, in opposition to this. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And you know, if there is a desire to, to speak on this bill, when does this come up again? At the, is this? I am not sure. Has this already been spoken to? I think it may have already been spoken to on the House. Sure. I'm not sure the this has been exact in education because I know all of our first committee bills have been exact, um, but the. The vote isn't on the yeah, legislative on the website. website right now. <laughs> yeah, okay. it's like it's it's it, yeah. I feel like it's been a very hard bill to to follow through where it yes. where it is. Okay, so it's probably I noticed that in a few bills that they were exact, but you couldn't find the, Thanks, like Senator. at the end of this yeah. week, you couldn't okay. find Thanks. the votes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all the work. Bye, Senator. <laughs> Somebody just knock on that door? No, I think oh. that was just. Oh, okay, so. all right. Um, okay, so I guess we'll find uh, appropriate time. You know, I was reminded when we celebrated Martha um, at the uh, there was an event on Saturday. Uh, there was a recollection, uh, her husband Jeff, of uh, uh, slaves petitioning for their um, for their freedom for the house, um, and that bill was. Uh, laid on the floor an expedient to legislate um, and then brought forth again by Martha uh, to uh, deliver them their freedom posthumously and uh, you know that would be the type of 
uh, discussion that you know would not be uh, that could possibly you know be confused with a divisive concept, even though it shows growth and 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 change over a, a course of time that that paints you know all of us with the ability to become uh, better and, and more human, um, but it's a frustrating uh, it's a frustrating bill uh, to say the least. So we will oppose it in in any way that we can. This does not have to go back to the city council uh, because again the the legislative principles I think. Uh, touch on that, but it might be something worth mentioning because I'm sure the community uh, would like to be aware that we are uh, we are opposing. And then, Jane, general discussion of bills the city is tracking. Uh, Jane has done an amazing job putting all the bills on the legislative subcommittee. Um, and yeah, round of applause for Jane there. The uh, um, so they can all be found on the city's website if you're watching along at home or uh, watching this on uh, YouTube at some later point um, by going to uh, just searching legislative uh, subcommittee and then under one of the menus uh, clicking uh, bills that are tracking. Jane, are there anything that you wanted to call out as a part of uh, that for discussion? Uh, sure. We already touched on House Bill 1033, which is the lobbying bill, and uh, I I know that is uh, coming up for a vote, and I know our delegates received a, um, a real eloquent email from Peter Laughlin. Uh, I would urge you to read it and, um, you know, consider uh, what he says. It's uh, really um, talks. He talks eloquently about, um, you know, when the state downshifts. You know, the city the city needs a voice, and municipalities need a voice. And he goes through some examples of of why lobbying is important. So I'll send it to our committee members if, mm -hmm. if they weren't copied on it, but I know our delegation was. Um, and then um, we are tracking House Bill 1073, which is um, removing the exemption for attorney-client work product. I don't know if you guys have <laughs> lived through this the last couple of years. There was a Supreme Court case um, that resulted in an amendment to 91A to specifically include the attorney-client work product in, uh, as an exemption from right to know. Uh, this bill removes that. So um, that is something NHMA is, is fighting very aggressively, um, and we're monitoring uh, that particular bill um, as that progresses. Um, the other uh, bills that other two bills that I just wanted to to flag that I think are coming for a vote on Thursday are um, House Bill 1268 um, and the report from that committee is ought to pass and that's the one restricting that general provision of creation of bylaws uh, under our ordinances 4717 and it's adding qualifying language to limit there was a, just a general provision that says you can create um, ordinances that are sort of in the best interest of the citizens that don't violate any state law but the language is limiting i believe to nuisance and this has been amended a lot i think this particular bill and nhma uh, believes this is uh, again a local authority uh, an assault on local authority they are via, via they are vigorously opposing it and um it's one of the the bills that uh, again appear, appears innocuous you know uh, at first reading but then when you think about it and you read it particularly the amendments and the debates about it it's concerning uh, the same was with um, uh, a health bill. It had similar language to start off with, House Bill 1272. Um, that has been voted out to pass on the consent calendar. Um, but again, it's a restriction of health officers' abilities to regulate. And again, narrowly kind of defines a laundry list of things that they can um, propose. So I just urge our delegates to be cognizant of that and cognizant of local authority when you cast your votes on Thursday. Um, and I think those were the ones that just jumped out at me um, from our from our very long list. Um, the the list is obviously getting shorter <laughs> because bills are getting ITLed and um, you know as as uh, crossover approaches it's going to be a really much smaller list that this committee can focus on um, for for legislative issues and that's what I had highlighted so thank you Jane um, 
the discussion of uh, legislation interest. Oh, first, was there any questions for Jane on that? No. Um, uh, I get to uh, meet with the mayors uh, of New Hampshire. Um, largely, I would say it, it falls into um, issues of local control. Uh, the NHMA um, is a uh, is a frequent um, uh, joiner of those roundtables, uh, where we haven't found universal uh, uh, support is opposing uh, the the Airbnb um, bill. Um, there, this is actually somewhat bipartisan, coming from folks in Manchester. Um, again, just different situation, not as vibrant tourism uh, community in in Manchester as is in uh, Portsmouth. Um, the the um, divisive compens education um, also haven't uh, uh, come up there, um, and I would say that um, we've met with the uh, the governor. Um, it was uh, more or less um, a, a discussion of whatever the legislature does, I'm supportive. He, he, he quoted to us that he doesn't particularly follow the bills um, himself. Um, there's a lot of bills uh, you know, from his perspective and that uh, if there are bills that need to be uh, followed up on, we're happy to reach out. So um, I would say that um, I think that it would be it would it would work better um, from a uh, a roundtable standpoint if there were bills that you think that the uh, the mayors should be aware of. Um, it is a uh, I think an effective lobbying group um, to to have uh, the mayors come out uh, against something. So I would much you know I'd view this more as a uh, a, a two way street. If you could bring uh, issues where we think that um, you know. Um, an example was the uh, the uh, the bill that failed uh, from a, uh, a a pillow uh, fee. Um, the the senator from Nashua said that Nashua was against it. Well, that happened to be news to Mayor Donchus of Manchester. Um, so things like that, I think there's an opportunity to uh, bring other kind of boots on the grounds, folks that are strapped for cash, uh, to to highlight and. If there's an opportunity uh, to do so, I would very much appreciate the the legislative delegation and this committee to to bring those forth as uh, agenda items uh, going forward. But we've had a couple of meetings, seem like reasonable people, um, and uh, I think it's if there's a if there's a way to try to direct them, that would be a, a good one to do. Um, and then Jane, back to you on the update on coalition committees. Um, yeah, we didn't. Uh, the the ones that w the coalition committee was tracking relative to donor town bills, they didn't have legs this session. So uh, one was, I think, at 608 was tabled, and then there were uh, quite a few other ones um, uh, on behalf of the the committee. Sort of the the public meeting and the remote meetings and the lobbying kind of rolled into the review and tracking because it obviously uh, affects the communities um, for the coalition. Committee community. But on ed funding, I was able to reach out to uh, Chris Dwyer, a former uh, city councilor, and uh, there is a bill that, um, uh, I'm forgetting the number, but it is, uh, it is the adoption of the Commission on Education's Fundings um, uh, really platform on changing the formula. And I believe it was retained in committee so that it's going to come back, but it's not going to come back this spring. And uh, the mayor had suggested that I reach out to Chris Dwyer, who was on the commission and uh, actually has presented um, to other legislative subcommittees slides on what the commission found. And so we can kind of understand it as a group and understand it in terms of this bill that is going to be in committee, that's going to be vetted and analyzed. Um, and the other issue is um, the education freedom accounts. I've reached out to our school department and there's a lot of current bills that I have not been able to follow. They're fast and furious and they're, they're, they're complicated. But the question from this committee was how does the 
current how do the current bills affect our budget so I've reached out to the school department on that as well and um, so Chris Dwyer is is able I thought if if this committee is uh, in agreement that we could do another legislative subcommittee on ed funding and kind of uh, get that going um, I I asked um, Chris when she was available and she is available every Monday um, between now and April 4th so um, again I don't know uh, whether this committee wants to uh, make a decision now on a date or whether we feel we want to wait on this and kind of deal with crossover or you know how we want to time um, the presentation of of this information added funding well I would suggest that given that um this is not an immediate issue for education funding in this year uh, that we wait until after uh, crossover unless there is something that you think these freedom account bills are going to have uh, an issue um, that we should be ahead of at the moment there, there was a bill that did make it through the education committee that would allow um, local education freedom accounts um, and that could result result in uh, as much as ten thousand dollars per student going out um, uh, when uh, a student like when a student who's eligible um, takes advantage of it or their parents do. Um, this is one I, I substituted on the education committee um, several times. This is one that came up in executive session and did make it through. I don't see any education bills on the House calendar this week, but that's one that will be coming up. Um, and uh, uh, there are also a number of bills that were uh, filed uh, intending to repeal education savings accounts to uh, to, to basically force the state to budget um, and live within a budget for education freedom accounts. All the, the bills that basically have been filed to repeal or limit um, have been killed in committee with House votes to come. If, if, they, if those bills are also killed in the House, they're dead for this year. So, um, uh, but I, I would say the, the education, the local education freedom account one is definitely one to track because that mm -hmm. could have significant impact on uh, local school budgets. How does that differ from the actual freedom accounts? You would ask me that. <laughs> I, um, it, it, uh, I think what I would need I, I would need to go back and look at the bill. Okay. Um, but I'll, what I'll do is I'll try to find a bill and try to find my notes on it. Um, it's one of one of the challenges you deal with as a legislator are 900 bills that are filed. We had. Um, we had 58 in our committee this session, and then in education, they had 104. So keeping them all straight, um, especially as you get older, <laughs> can be sure. a I mean, little bit of a challenge. But I do, but that is one that kind of comes to mind, top of mind is one that okay. should mm -hmm. be tracked. Well then maybe let's try to get the, uh, it, it's important I think, um, former Councilor Dwyer is an excellent resource on education funding. Let's try to have her in um, to speak on uh, that and you know education is how or in funding education is kind of how this whole state operates in both fair and unfair ways uh, but really you know uh, moves the the needle uh, and uh, it, you know finding out when, when you find out that the lottery doesn't pay you know for the whole uh, you know the whole kit and caboodle of education funding you know the the uh, the curtain is revealed uh, a little bit here uh, in the state of New Hampshire. So I think understanding that as quickly as it can as a, a legislative subcommittee meeting uh, might be a useful useful. So uh, Jane, do you want to reach out and, and suggest a uh, a time in March later in the month, uh, two or three weeks from now? Does this morning time work for for most? people uh, at uh, you know the 10 o'clock hour on Mondays mm -hmm. does the March 28th uh, date seem to work Works for me. yeah I think so um, March 28th we have another committee that's already scheduled in this room oh well that's a no then <laughs> 
Oh, we can or oh. We move the time. Is that what other committee is that? That governance. Governance is meeting in here. At ten. At ten to eleven thirty. Okay. Approximately. Could we do it earlier? Could we, we could do it, do it at early? nine. Mm -hmm. Would that okay. work? All right. Without anything else, any other questions? The the bill number is uh, uh, six zero seven HB six zero seven, establishing local education savings accounts for students. All right. I believe six zero eight, <laughs> and I believe six zero eight is the, the that big funding one, the the one that that went to. I believe that went to committee. Yes. Mm. And I. I any questions from the uh, the Zoom verse there? Representative Hamlet or Representative Ward? No, nope, we're good. I just say John John and I are trying to keep uh, the right to vote alive, which is not easy to do. We're both on the same committee. <laughs> and uh, John has done a great across the aisle uh, effort to get Rank choice voting approved at least as a uh, bit of enabling legislation, which is a real triumph. Well, thank you both for that that effort. You know, more people voting is. Oh, we didn't get the redistricting update. Um, we did not. So uh, well, that uh, people should just contact the governor at this point. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yep. So as I understand the, um, and correct me if I'm I'm wrong, um, that the House maps have been approved. Is that correct? And the Senate maps and the EC and the Executive Council maps have been approved, but. The governor has put himself into a box with the congressional maps, or? I don't know. Do, do you remember? Representative Ward? Yeah, I think that's uh, accurate. We still haven't gotten it, the Senate bills from crossover, but okay. they're not going to change. Okay. okay. But the, 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 the district, uh, the governor has stated that he doesn't like to look at them, but well, that's. Well, good. I think the more he hears from people, the better. Okay. Well, this is the first that, you know, since we've had districts uh, in New Hampshire, this would be the first time that Portsmouth would not be in the congressional first district. I think going back to 1847, uh, which is impressive. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that were not effective in 1847, but that one, uh, you know, keeping us in a regional community with other seafaring, you know, coastal towns seems like a, a, a positive thing to, to move forward. So. Um, I think that we should uh, we should probably write a letter uh, on uh, on on that to to represent fair maps. So I would weigh a motion to uh, to uh, to to write a letter to the governor uh, uh, proposing fair representative maps uh, uh, from the legislative subcommittee. I I'm so moved. <laughs> I'll second. second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, uh, Mayor. Yep. Thank you. That's great. Um, Mayor, would you please note that it makes it difficult to do a, our work with Rockingham Planning Commission when you split our county uh, across districts as far as federal funding for things like Coast Bus Service and mm. um, all Definitely. Of our initiatives. I think we should uh, we should add that uh, to the note um, and also mention the you know the. The regionality. There's different, you know, centers. Like we are viewed as a seacoast community when it came to uh, when it um, when it came to um, COVID tracking and whatnot. And this would also split that out, you know, and put us in the same position as as Keene. And gotten to know the mayor there. Seems like a really nice guy, but you know, we are not uh, neighbors with with Keene um, from a uh, from a federal uh, standpoint. They do not have a port. Uh, they do not face the same issues that. Uh, that that we do um, so uh, yes we will get that letter out and you know potentially craft that as a as an op-ed from the legislative subcommittee uh, as well to share with the paper uh, all just, right just as a note um, in looking at the calendar I'm not sure this is updated and whether there's been an amendment but House Bill 607 uh, that looks like it's been tabled um, under it, 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 and I'm looking at the same thing that I was wondering, looking for a moment to bring that up. Um, uh, 
there have been a bunch of bills. But lately. there are several, right? <laughs> so we'll we'll look at the universe of yeah. those and make it, sure it didn't get. It can get know. taken off the table. There, but the yeah. reason this one went off is uh, if you look at the vote above it. Right. Um, Special. There's. Okay. I think there's there's a lot of concern even among people who support education freedom accounts because of the 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 actual cost to the state in the first year is way higher mm -hmm. than the education commissioner uh, predicted on the order of oh, millions yeah. of dollars. <laughs> higher. Hundreds of millions so of dollars. There, there is a lot of concern about, you know, um, maybe biting too much of the apple off too soon, even among people who favor education okay. freedom accounts. So, um, uh, uh, that the but one thing to be aware of is that um the table something that's laid on the table i believe uh, it could come off this it's possible for something like this to come off the table it's one of the things that they tell us to watch pay attention for. to watch. during mm -hmm. the during the session and a lot of it will depend on um on uh how many people show up and that that's mm -hmm. that's going to that could potentially be an issue for thursday because we're going back into reps hall for the first time in two years um and reps hall is significantly smaller than the venues where we've been holding legislative sessions to date where more distancing mm. is is allowable in reps hall think of it as like a like a theater that was designed um, two centuries ago mm -hmm. <laughs> um, when people were a lot smaller uh, and the seats are packed very, very tightly and there's no room for distancing. So okay. attendance will be an issue. Well, uh, we wish you well and, and luck in going there. Hopefully um, you were all safe um, sitting as close together. Uh, as you will be and um, that the, the people's business gets done. Um, it's appreciated again by by Portsmouth um, and everybody that tracks uh, this and we'll do our bit to uh, to help more people understand, you know, the work that, that you're doing and, and hopefully we can do together. So uh, with that, I will await a motion to adjourn unless there is further business by anyone here. Move we adjourn your honor. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.